Welcome to the, sorry, let me start again. <laughs> Welcome to Best Practice, a show where we interview leaders in the building industry to impact the tools, strategies, and tactics they use to run uh, great organizations. Today, I'm very excited uh, to be with Idan Naor. Idan is founder and principal in charge of the eponymous Idan Naor Workshop. Uh, full disclosure, Idan and I went to grad school together uh, and I am very excited to reconnect with him uh, about his experiences working in the industry um, at various different levels, which is which is really cool, and uh, and what he's learned along the way. Thanks so much for joining me, Don. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, so uh, as usual, I like to start off just by talking a little bit about what's been your career trajectory thus far. Um, you know, even I, I think you you actually had some experiences before grad school, just you know, what, what led you to architecture and, uh, and all that. So, mm -hmm. okay. It's always um, interesting where to kind of start your origin story. But um, I think in, in my case, one of the things that's important to begin with is maybe a little bit of biographical um, inheritance, which was uh, that I, I grew up, um, you know, my first years were in Tel Aviv and then I bounced to Boston and back and then in, I, I lived in Providence, uh, Rhode Island and in New York. And I think have, you know, by virtue of growing up in like different cultures and experiencing different um, cities, you're kind of automatically a, a sort of outsider. Um, you're, you're automatically in a point of reflection before you actually engage um, or accept the status quo. And I didn't realize that that would um, be kind of a, a formative biographical characteristic until um, until much later. But I think that's important um, for me when I kind of trace the trajectory, um, because I have kind of a multi hyphenated hyphenated background. Um, I went to school after, uh, you know, traveling the world a little bit and doing a bunch of other things um, that led me to really pursue a liberal arts education. Um, and again, by virtue of, of coming from a different culture where that's not the norm, usually mm. um, where, where I'm from, you kind of apply to uh, a specific faculty. Um, so you kind of know it's, it's more of like a vocational approach. Um, I knew that there was this alternate reality um, in the States where liberal arts as an education, as a mindset, as an approach um, was something that people value. And so I had to kind of make this decision again um, by virtue of straddling two worlds and knowing two options, you become more active about those decisions. Um, and so it, it kind of began with a curiosity about learning. Um, and it led me to pursue uh, a degree in liberal arts. Um, I was trained as a historian and as an economist. Um, and, and, you know, ultimately economics for me was like the thing that, you know, a 20 something year old does uh, with hopes of getting a job to pay off loans at the end of, a, of an education. Um, but I remember, you know, it, it, it became something that started off as, as practical and actually was super interesting. Like once I got past those introductory level economics courses, it started to blow my mind. Um, I remember we, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent, but I'll, I'll summarize shortly. Um, yeah, let's go. But we, Please. yeah, we, um, I remember there was this class in development economics and the idea that I think at the time, this was probably 20 something years ago at this point. So um, I'm a little rusty, but the, there was a, a Nobel laureate that was studying microfinance um, and they basically had this information problem. So in the States, everyone kind of, you know, if you're an adult and you consume and you have a credit history, there's kind of an information um, set about you. So when you go out to extend um, applications like for, for a loan or something like that, a bank or a lender can match the interest rate in a competitive way because they have this data set mm. on, um, on who you are and like your spending habits and um, what probability you will return that money with. And so, fine. So, so in America, we have this kind of system that's set up, but take countries like India, for example, Mm. Um, where if you're like a farmer in a rural village um, and you want to buy like another cow, uh, there's not a lot of, even though it's not a lot of capital, it's just not available for you. So there's this huge stifling effect um, with this kind of information problem that exists in places like rural India. Um, and 
I remember this economist was doing work and like one of his models was really able to engineer a social interaction and kind of transfer this problem, this information problem to the farmer. So, you know, there is a reality around this farmer mm. that exists, right? It's just that the bank doesn't know it. So whether this farmer is someone who will pay back the loan um, and is would be like a great candidate for the bank, the bank doesn't know it. And so this economist comes up with this model to bridge that gap and solve this problem. And the way they do it is they say, okay, that reality exists around that farmer. Who knows that reality? A neighboring rural villager, right? Mm. So have them now co-apply, go in for a loan together. And I can't remember the exact mechanics of it, but there was like a disincentive if you choose a partner that um, kind of has a high risk of defaulting. Right. You know that because you've grown up with this person. And so you will not self-select to go and get a loan with that person. So by virtue of two people coming together, they both have an incentive to go in with someone that they have full confidence will um, you know, repay the loan. And so there's a disincentive if one of the partners doesn't, and there's a great incentive if, if both partners do. And so they've now transferred this information problem to, um, to the actual people uh, applying for a loan. And all of a sudden unleash this like amounts you know, an immense amount of capital and, and hence growth um, for an economy at a microfinance level. And stuff like that blew my mind. Um, at the same time, I took classes, you know, fully embracing the liberal arts approach um, in history. And, and I think all my professors in history made the most profound um, impact on the way I started to, to just, you know, I, I, I would sit in these classes and like, I would feel my mind physically stretching yeah. So I, I just kept going. Um, and then after that, I think, and I'm about to segue into maybe the more important part for our conversation. Um, in the spirit of exploration, I took this like elective uh, sculpture class and it was an installation sculpture class. And one of the exercises was like design like a small scale object. Um, and I designed this soup bowl for two and it was a carved wood bowl. And Basically the presentation was like two people, I cooked the stew and like put it in the bowl and two people basically sat down and had to eat from the bowl at the same time. And the catch was that if you would eat more quickly than the other person, you would consume a larger amount of soup. And so I started to kind of be fascinated by the idea that even though it's like something as seemingly craft oriented as a bowl, it could have like a larger um, implication on some kind of social uh, interaction and consideration. And then, you know, when you start to think about how that can scale up and the idea of transscolarity in, in architecture, that started to like really be fascinating to me. And I didn't realize it at the time, but um, my, my teacher, Allison Weiss, who's I think an artist practicing in, in um, California or based in California, she had the foresight to tell me, you know, if you ever need a, a recommendation letter for architecture school, just, um, you know, hit me up. And I kind of looked at her and said, oh, that's, you know, that's a, a great compliment. But in my mind, I was like, what are you talking about? I'm like doing history and economics and I don't even know what architecture is. All that to say, I don't have architecture in the family. Um, it's, it's not genetically in my blood, um, but it has been ever since I think that conversation. Um, and so from then, I don't know, again, again, I think the audience is mostly like people who, who are practicing less of a student audience. So I won't go into like, the whole school process. Um, but I did discover uh, Columbia through the intro to architecture program. Um, and that's, you know, uh, a, a wonderful immersive blur um, to what architecture is and could be. Um, I don't I don't remember much about what actually translated to what I'm doing today. But I do remember being fascinated and captivated by um, kind of a, a different way of thinking. And I remember after that, you know, Columbia is great at um, doing what they do and they're in the business of pedagogy and, and garnering so much excitement in, in the students and it totally worked. And after that game was over, um, it was kind of like, you know, if you want to play again, just add another coin. And so I, I, I applied for another semester of the New York Paris program, developed a portfolio um, that led to the MARC um, and that's where we met. Hmm. And that was also uh, for me a very formative uh, time. And then I think it was it was the career fair right before our graduation um, that I met someone who was the technical director 
at the time. Um, I think he still is at uh, Rogers Marvel. And we just hit it off, you know, in the career fair, we had a great conversation. And so I basically from this to that started working um, at Rogers Marvel, like the Monday after graduation. And I basically like joined this team that was full on in Revit. And, you know, we knew Revit from school, but then you go into like this project that's CD set version six um, of like a 200,000 square foot building, like class A building. Um, and it was just such a wonderful learning curve, um, you know, all immersive. So I did that um, for a while and simultaneously worked on other really interesting projects with the firm. But this one project kept surfacing at different moments. And then eventually Rogers and Marvel um, had an amicable divorce. And this project went with uh, Rogers Partners, which is where uh, I went as well. Um, and then something interesting happened. A lot of the people who were more senior on the project ended up um, either not transferring or leaving shortly thereafter. So I happened to be kind of the last person standing. Um, and I was way too young to kind of like carry this, this project through and it was already in construction. Mm. Um, and I think they kind of, you know, all the decision makers kind of looked left and right, tried to find someone with like 15 years of experience. Um, and with all the challenges that entails at the end of a project, they kind of said, well, you know what, let's maybe give you Don a chance. Um, and so mm -hmm. we had this conversation about me taking on the project um, and having the technical director um, who I had a great rapport with kind of take me under his wing. Um, and so that's what ended up happening. And that was, you know, such a blessing in disguise at the time. Very stressful to inherit a project that was in Revit with like this crazy, I mean, this was like 2012 or 13 or something. Um, and Revit for the office on a very large scale project was mm. something that was like still a large experiment. So we had someone who was like super technical working on the curtain wall um, and they were doing this in AutoCAD. And then they were importing and like, you know, basically referencing these AutoCAD files. And then they left or the office split up and that person was no longer there. So I'm like answering RFI number 490 about like a curtain wall whose drawings are in AutoCAD. Like it was just such a trying experience. Um, yeah. And from that, I think I gained like this confidence that even if stuff is really complex and you can't really figure it out, you number one need to know who to go to um, mm. to ask questions and you need to figure out ways to like just get a handle on stuff. Hmm. And, and that gave me an immense confidence, I think. So towards like the tail end of that, um, I was about to be staffed on another project and um, a friend of mine uh, came up to me with a project. We'd been talking for a while about maybe doing something together. Um, and he had found something great, like right around the block from, uh, from both of us. So we had known the block, we knew the building. And it was a big enough project to kind of, you know, really consider heavily, even though I loved my job um, at, at Rogers Marvel and then at Rogers. So I kind of had a really great um, two way conversation with them. And they were really generous in terms of allowing me to like stay on the CA for this large project that was towards the end um, while transitioning. So that made my transition a lot, a lot softer, um, you know, financially, logistically. Um, and so that was great. And then one thing, you know, as a funny anecdote, I always remember that Rob Rogers, when we had kind of an exit interview, he said something that I, I, I thought was just his way of kind of um, just being nice and having like a, a, you know, a nice exit interview. And he said, I, you know, I, at the time the office was in Tribeca, I live in Brooklyn and I would bike to work. And I think I thought at the time he was trying to speak my language and he said, you know, so you're trying to start your own thing. That's great. Um, you'll see, uh, you know, it's kind of like riding a bike and you'll be riding. And all of a sudden, like, you'll notice that it's not going that smooth and people are honking and you almost crash and you feel like you're running through red lights. And then you kind of you pause and, and you look around, you realize you've been going through midtown Manhattan, like on a one way street going the wrong way. 
but with time you kind of get back on that bike and you start weaving in and out of traffic and it becomes like second nature um and you know how to read all the streets by heart you don't even need to look at the signs and i said oh, okay you know that's a great analogy you know thanks and I, I kind of walked away um and then over the years that like i've had peppered meaning um to look back on that and and i totally get what he's saying now and i think with time i'll get it even more so so yeah that that kind of brings us to the transition of going out on my own and i kind of you know i didn't make as conscious of a decision about going off on on my own as i think some people make if they've been in the industry for like 30 years and they have like mm -hmm. a huge rolodex of of clients that they've been working with and um and they just kind of carry on a lot of that, a lot of that business. Um, for me, it was more of an adventure. It was like, let's jump in the water and, and try and figure stuff out. Um, and since then, we've had um, a really fantastic journey. It's been a roller coaster. I think like every um, small practice in New York City, everything moves fast. Um, we're still on that bike um, and we're still dodging traffic um, and we're having a great time doing it. So we've, you know, we kind of, um, love to prioritize projects if they're actually new for us like a new building type um, is a little bit more exciting than something we've done a million times um, at the same time we we think we can provide a lot of value for those projects that we have done a lot so we work with private residential clients we work with uh, developers we work with investors who are trying to figure out like what can be done um, on certain plots of land and which developers to actually partner with. So we kind of help um, uh, make those matches sometimes. And then we kind of um, work with nonprofits. Um, we've done commercial office space. Um, so we've kind of had a, a wide gamut. Um, and then we always try and make time for speculative research and competitions like um, most aspiring practicing um, designers. So, you know, it, it keeps us busy, it keeps us satisfied, um, it keeps us curious, and definitely keeps us hungry, so. That's, uh, that's such a, thank, thanks so much for sharing that, that uh, kind of journey. Um, there's some pretty, there's some highlights in there that I think are, are, are just pretty fascinating. One is the, that, because I, I think in the industry in general, right, there's a, sort of this perception about, um, paying your dues, right? It's like a mm -hmm. sort of a topic that, that comes up a lot um, in relation to like, you know, employ people that come out of grad school immediately and like, um, we're, we're actually working on a, on a diagram that's sort of this idea of the hype cycle, which is just in technology, it's like people get really, really excited and then it kind of drops into what they call the trough of disillusionment and then it kind of picks up for a new technology. We're kind of making the same assumption about like, the career of an architect is very similar. Like, oh, there's all this expect, like heightened expectation when you go to school. And then there's this sort of trough of like a mismatch between like what your ambition, what you feel your ambition can, can do mm -hmm. versus like what the reality of practice will allow. And part of that is a little bit about this kind of notion of paying your dues. And I'm, I'm curious, like the opportunity you were given at that point, which is not a traditional opportunity, right? In the sense that like, you know, you, you highlighted it, right? You felt, you know, you recognized you're pretty young to be doing what you were doing at that time, or you felt that you might be too young for, for that kind of level of responsibility. But it was structured in such a way that did allow you to rise up to that occasion, right? Mm -hmm. To be able mm -hmm. to do that work. And you were mm -hmm. sort of given that, that, uh, the opportunity, right? Because at the end of the day, that, that's what it is. So I'm, I'm curious how that experience has how does that shape the way you look at how you run your business in general because i think there's another sub team theme to all of this which is a more of a maybe maybe a, a more macro conversation about just the industry in general but you know even when you said something like the find trying to find somebody with 15 years of experience right that is that is actually indicative of something that happened you know um like for 15 years of experience that at that time meant that in 2008, a lot of people, people left the industry, the mm -hmm. amount of people that actually had 15 years of experience was very, very little to begin with in New York. Um, it sets up this condition where you're given this opportunity. So I'm wondering, sort of uh, synthesize it, is, you know, if 
has that shaped your perspective on how you look at people that you bring on to work with you? How has it shaped your perspective in working in the environment that you work in today, which I, we've talked a little bit about is more in a remote setting? Mm-hmm. You know, it has, has that impacted your strategy at all? Well, for sure. I mean, I, I think number one, there's a certain acrobatics um, that every firm owner has to go through and you don't really appreciate or even understand it um, unless you've kind of witnessed it firsthand. So I always knew, oh, staffing must be challenging. Like, how do you actually wrap your mind around getting like 60 people to actually be efficient in different you know, life cycles of a project? Um, and so I, I assumed it was challenging, but when you actually sit down, I mean, now I make my decision sometimes like, do we hire someone versus do we um, collaborate with someone who we see more eye to eye with, who has their own practice versus do we get like an independent contractor versus do we just outsource portions of our workflow? And part of it is like, do I wanna manage 100% of someone and be responsible as an employer? Um, versus like, my, my real role is to orchestrate the team and and allow everyone the space to maximize their potential right so if i feel like i can't do that in the best way i won't even put myself in that position Mm. um and i think it was very smart on their behalf like i had the potential within me um, to rise up to the challenge um, or at least i had a good shot of doing that with the right amount of um, supervision and i think they realized that and they knew you know it also takes um that supervision in place i mean we're talking about like you know, a gray haired technical director who um, for all that it symbolizes and all that it's worth, like knew everything there is to know about building. Hmm. Um, Maybe he hadn't opened AutoCAD, never maybe even knew how to open Revit. That didn't matter. Um, Any any question I had about the actual RFI in place, he was able to kind of sit down for two hours and explain everything there was to know about how to detail, how to watch out for stuff. And then he was also, he had like a kind of sage like wisdom about him that um, was equally meaningful, you know? So I think as a firm owner, you have to make sure that there's kind of a robust network of people. And they don't all, you know, it's interesting how the firm is organized or how it isn't organized, but you have to have those people around um, and you have to be able to reach out and you have to provide, I think going back to your question, you have to provide that space um, for every person, whether it's an independent worker, an employee, um, a key uh, consulting engineer or other key consultant or broker um, or wh- whoever else you're working with, they have to kind of, number one, understand the overall intent of whatever the mm-hmm. project is, whatever scale it is, understand their role in it. And then everyone has to be on the same page of like, what is this person's passion, maximum potential opportunity and how to allow for that to happen. Um, and I think being able to motivate every team member to, to kind of maximize their role is the best way to achieve, um, I think, the best result for our clients. Otherwise, um, there's a lot to tap into that, that, that would be a missed opportunity. So that's, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, no, I, th- I mean, it does. I, th- I think I mean, basically a little bit about it is like for you and your practice, because the you you have intention when it comes to the projects that you pick to work on that it kind of starts there and then everything is about how do you assemble the team to meet the needs of that specific project um whether that requires you bringing on some someone for a more long time engagement versus um working with let's say a a talent pool of people that that can provide their skill sets to to a given uh job and I, i what i think about that is like really fascinating is like you've you've maybe maybe intentionally or, or or not intentionally but through that experience you've kind of maybe has, has it really has informed the way in which you look at working relationships in general that mm-hmm. the person on the other side is probably contributing a lot more than like what you like you know cr- critically it's important to think about 
people as talent in my mind like that mm-hmm. i have a strong opinion of that that like everyone contributes something to a conversation mm-hmm. the question is whether you can motivate them to perform their best or train them to perform their best uh, and and that's pretty much all you can do right so either someone's already has the skills and it's really a question of motivation how uh, it seems like sometimes that's that's your sort of like that's your strategy at some point when you you uh find someone talent or it's someone that maybe not doesn't have as much experience and but they have the potential. So it's a matter of how you train mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. But those are the, the kind of two levers you have. And um, and I also, it, I, I hearken back to something that I hope doesn't sound too out of place, but there was this old like book of Zen antics that I used to read when I was a kid. And I remember one of the little quotes, I think it was um, by Shunryu Suzuki. Um, and I think it was like Zen mind, beginner mind. I don't know if you've ever read this, but it was like super fashionable when I was growing up and like everyone had it. But I remember um, a quote there and I'm maybe I don't remember it verbatim, but it was basically like, do not try and control people. Um, the only way, you know, to control like a sheep, for example, is to let it roam in an open field and just watch it. Um, kind of like the best thing you can do is watch people. Hmm. First, you know, I, again, I, I, I don't know if I fully embraced what that could mean, but now that I haven't thought about this in like 30 years, by the way, um, but I'm thinking out loud. And, and part of what it means, I think, is like watch people, watch what they, you know, everyone has like these inherent interests and inherent potential. Um, and, and the worst thing you can do is like try and control people or try and force people to do something they're not great at. So yeah. I think a one of the most pivotal things about running your own practice or just being a great designer is really with a lot of humility and, and sincerity, be a great observer and then a great listener and like prioritize that as the starting block for any process. Um, whether it's a client or a consultant, like as soon as you know who you're dealing with and what motivates them and what they could be good at, then you can start to orchestrate, right? Um, otherwise, you're going to get the same tune that they've been used to singing. Right. And, right. and I think, you know, for me, that that's what it means to kind of be a leader of either a small team, myself, or like a Fortune 500 company. Yeah, no, it, apl- it applies at any scale. Um, and, and in different contexts, too. I'm very curious about your, your process when it comes to deciding on what to what products you want to work on. Um, what framework have you come up with to help you, uh, especially because the, the nature of the work, it seems is like, since you're not necessarily hiring, hiring full-time people to work with you, just because, you know, which would then incur you to like have to bring on projects, you know, it, it might actually change the rubric for, in, for what, what you bring on, uh, because you need to, to support a team. So I'm curious, like without that now, how has that structured your due diligence when it comes to new projects? Um, it's, it's a good question. I'm not, you know, I think, I think it's a, it's a constant exploration. Um, but I would say, you know, you kind of have this like trifecta um, to that dilemma. So any project that you consider taking on, it's like, what is the actual time commitment? Like, what are the resources we're dealing with? It's like time, money, and I would say like, you know, creative energy essentially, right? Um, and that starts to frame how you think about like, can we or do we want to do this? And being, you know, being a nimble practice affords you, um, I think the freedom to make that decision. And the more you grow, the more you kind of have to, to feed the machine. And so I'm always looking for that sweet spot um, because you know, we, we, I think most architects embarked upon this journey with the intent of leading a creative life that also has a lot of like very grounded, um, you know, technical aspects um, to actualize these hopes and aspirations into um, kind of like allowing for a possible future that or futures that we think uh, we believe in. And so I think you know, if, if that's your compass, in a way, if that's where you want to steer the ship and it's a long journey, right? It's, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Um, 
you have to be very careful, especially as, as, a, as a small firm with your time, because you can start to take on projects that don't meet the kind of, so I would say in terms of like answering your question, maybe there's, I don't know, three, it's like maybe the client, the interest and the fee, right? And you kind of have to balance those three forces. Um, if the client is someone who is really interesting for whatever reason, it could be that they are just a great person to work with. And we all know that it takes two to tango, like to get a really good um, project, you need that good client. You cannot do it. You cannot even come close to doing it yourself. So we choose clients very carefully. Um, and then the fees are like, you know, if, if, if the client and well, let me, let me start off not with the fee, with the other part, which is the interest, right? So I, for example, am really interested in doing um, one building type of each, you know, and then kind of circling back. It's more of a generalist approach um, rather than, than being a super specialist in one, even though that happens over time regardless. But as a personal interest, like that's what I would love to do. So if, if someone comes to me with a new building type and they're willing um, to kind of have a deep conversation about it, we start to have that part of the Venn diagram take more precedence. And then the fee, you know, that works its way and it's pretty straightforward. Like, will it be profitable? And then if it isn't profitable, um, I don't think we've ever taken on a project that's not um, profitable when we're working with clients and not self-initiating projects. Um, because as a business, you just, you know, you're not gonna be sustainable if you're not profitable. So we make sure um, to have that take care of what it needs to take care of. Um, but I will say, if like you reach out to me and say, hey Don, let's collaborate on, on something that's, that's more speculative in nature, or we wanna do like a competition that, that really, you know, hits the other two components. If the timing's right, I'm, I'm totally game for that. And it means that the fees aren't there, but the other two aspects are like, you know, in, in a really good spot. So it's, it's all dynamic and, and it has to do with, you know, our interest at a given time and um, our long-term game, because we might lose the short game on, on maybe that like fee aspect, but if it gets us to where we want to go in the long-term, um, it's a kind of decision that, that we have to make um, almost on a, on a weekly basis. Hmm. And I, I'm sure one question that comes to mind is that kind of when you're making that trade off of like the work that we want versus, it, uh, you know, across that kind of like um, trifecta or the three prong stool that you have, um, where, you know, you have the interest side and you have the client side as an opportunity uh, over weighing fee. You know, I think for a lot of people that are that are starting out or that they have small practices, for them, it's always like, like, how have you structured it such that, you know, you can invest that time? Because again, that's that's pretty much like a like that's a speculative investment that you're making of your mm -hmm. time and effort. Mm -hmm. How are you, how are you able to supplement that with the worst of the work that you've done? I mean, essentially, do you have multiple lines of revenue that help to generate your like sustain this in some way, or is it the profitability side helps you float for a very long time? in order for you to have that optionality? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, because I think it speaks to anyone who runs um, a business entity at any scale for more than a very short amount of time. So sooner or later, you're gonna kind of go through a business cycle um, or you're gonna go through a project cycle and you learn very quickly that you need a war chest um, you need to squirrel away money when revenues um, relative to your float are, are up. And then when they're down, um, you need to live off that or you need to find other like sources of revenue or an ecosystem that's deep. So, you know, one thing is that we, we kind of, you know, really nurture um, our network of clients and we try and always kind of um, stay in, in close touch with them um, 
And then when times are like slower, we can reach out and say, hey, this thing we've been talking about for a while, is that something you want to pick up? We, this is a great time for us right now. And we do a lot of consulting. Um, we, we've been brought in to like do project management for others people, other people's projects that have gone astray. Um, and, and those are things that, again, maybe in terms of like the client and in terms of maybe uh, touching a building type that, um, that we find interesting would be great. And then in, in addition, the fees and the timing work for us. So we've kind of developed this way of working. Maybe it doesn't necessarily go up into your portfolio. Um, and we've done more, more work than I'd like to admit that we'd never have a picture of. Um, but it's just part of keeping things rolling, you know, and um, we've kind of, we've been in business for, I think over six, over six years. So it just takes a lot of juggling um, to keep moving forward. Um, and I, I can tell you, I still get stressed when, um, you know, cash flow becomes challenging, but I've become so much more used to it. Mm. Um, and I'm just, you know, I, I don't quickly spend when, when it's very positive. Um, and I don't stress out too much when it's negative and it always seems to work out. So that's part of um, why I kind of really like maintaining a tight ship and not growing for the sake of growth, but really growing. And I've had, you know, I'm happy to, I don't know if we have enough time, but there have been a lot of projects at large scales that could have meant like really fast growth and onboarding a lot of people in terms of fees um, and in terms of project duration, but the client and the interest was just below my threshold. Um, and so we've given up those opportunities too. So I think part of, of what you have to uh, come to terms with is realizing that saying no is sometimes more important. And you kind of hear that. And I heard that being said to me before. And I was like, yeah, yeah I'm going to be the yes person for everything. And then you kind of, if you do have that approach, you, you learn the, the hard way <laughs> sooner than later. So well, I'm, very, I'm super curious, like, what would you say is like a big red flag for you? Um, cause I, you know, sometimes this is not as talked about as much as like, what's the, when a prospective client comes to you, like identifying what those red flags are is not necessarily common knowledge. Mm -hmm. I, th I think I'm, I'm also, uh, uh, really fascinated by this idea that as a community, as an, as an organizational community, we should be trying to take away, we should be trying to make implicit things like not like implicit forms of knowledge the things that you sort of like pick up by you know hearsay or through like mentorship or through it's not very structured and turning it into like a resource um so for like in your experiences what have been those red flags for you or like oh if a client approached us with xyz we just never would take it on there's so many ways i can answer that question um Sometimes it boils down to just like intuition and chemistry. Um, I came across someone, someone reached out. I don't even know how they found my information, but they reached out and they were like, I have this big tract of land um, and I want to do like this stuff that seemed amazing on paper. And then we met and it, it, it just didn't feel right. And it, it turned out that they had hired this architect, gone through like a community board approval process and then fired this arc. It just sounded like a disaster um, in terms of how they approached the architect. Um, and so that was a huge red flag. It was like someone who uh, maybe didn't value the design process more than they valued approvals. And there are firms that will take on that kind of work. But for us, you know, um, again, unless the client is really interesting and maybe we, we see an opportunity for um, mutual growth in other directions. We typically don't take stuff on um, that's, you know, just about paperwork or um, that, that doesn't have a kind of interest on another level for us. So that would be one red flag. And then some people are just like, unfortunately, a complete mess. And, you know, I had people reach out that have stop work orders and they have all this stuff going on with their projects and it's clearly been mismanaged. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to anyone, but if I feel like it's it's a client that has unrealistic expectations um, or that wants to like start yesterday and be done tomorrow and have it be like really high quality and, you know, um, rock bottom pricing, it's just that that doesn't exist. So it's just meeting expectations and being very communicative. And when I feel like a client is just reasonable about their approach and it doesn't have to be that they've worked with an architect um, 
you know, a million times before. We we work with many first time, you know, home buyers or first time mm, developers. Um, but as long as, as they're receptive, as, like they need to have some kind of familiarity, to be honest, um, for me to be excited about working with them. So it can be, you know, I just had someone reach out uh, recently about um, kind of a first time home buying experience and they had never really worked with an architect, but they've been reading a lot about the process. So they've already been kind of conditioned um, to understanding the value and they've read a lot of great sources. Um, so for me, it was like that, that's a great starting point. And then we work with people who have worked with like architects for 30 years and they're just not really happy with their current situation or just want to try different avenues. Um, and that's a great starting point because we can typically, I think, provide a lot of value and be very competitive um, for what we provide versus um, the fees that we typically charge. So, you know, some clients that have been around the block with like great architects still just want to try something new and they give us a chance and then we, we please them. So, um, you know, I think there's many different ways, but going back to your question about red flags, unrealistic expectations, um, and that could be like budgetary schedule, um, even just like personality, if they think that the architect was at fault for X, Y, Z, and that's why they fired them. And it just doesn't sound like a legit reason to be angry at someone. Um, I usually kind of pass. So. I think that's important for, for listeners too, as a side, because I think they're, you know, as a business, you might want to focus a lot on, on the fee, right? Or just like the lifeblood, right? Or just being able to sustain the, the practice. But a lot of times picking the, like not doing your due diligence at the very beginning of a relationship can lead to worse outcomes than even the initial fee, right? It could cost you more. You could lose way more than uh, money. And I've, um, I worked uh, in, in small firm situations where, you know, uh, the the owners were kind of joke a little bit about how when they did the the math they were making like a dollar an hour or something on some projects and that expectation setting is so critical um or at least like being able to evaluate that on the side of the client right um how have you how have you navigated when a client so there's a scenario in which a client comes to you and like they have some knowledge about the building industry or like what it takes to you know even even if they have experience with the renovation it's probably even a better better experience um, um, than when someone that doesn't. But let's say someone doesn't, it's a first time developer, first time client, has no idea what an architect even does. Um, what, what uh, besides the fact that they know they need to go to you, um, what uh, have you provided or, or resources have you found have been really helpful in general to help educate them? Yeah, so uh, one thing we're in the process of doing is creating um, videos that show the process that we go through. Um, and, and the analog version of that is that we meet and I actually bring, depending on the project, I'll bring like a precedent, um, or a set of construction drawings, um, or some kind of artifact to show them, um, maybe what the process begins to entail if they've never experienced it. And then I'll point them to a bunch of resources and we have like a little PDF package that walks you through the process. Um, and they're tailored to like, you know, if, because we happen to deal with, with um, developers and residential clients that are very different and commercial um, office space tenants, we have kind of a different packet for each one to show them what the process typically like, things to watch out for, important milestones, um, and just how to think about it. And and I know that we can do so much more that, you know, with that. Um, and I know you've been curious about the role that like technology such as YouTube or other things or different platforms um, can play in that. And I'm, I'm super interested in that. Um, and that's something that um, we're definitely going to look into because I think it's, it's such low hanging fruit today, you know, it's there. Um, and it's the same way Zoom was there before the pandemic. And it allowed us to kind of think about um, our practice as much more kind of like horizontal um, in the way that we, we come together as a network rather than like this extractive practice that, you know, the typical architecture firm um, is a marginal or incremental business, right? And you kind of, you hire as cheap and amazing talent as you can. Um, you allow them to grow and you provide great opportunities, but you also kind of charge clients as much as, as the market's willing to bear. And then you hope to manage the process in the most efficient manner and, and enjoy from the profits of the margins. I personally am less excited about that model of working. Um, 
I'm not saying we'll never do that um, as a primary business model, but right now it's been working really great um, to try something else. Hmm. Um, and for me, that's leadership. It's like, you know, if the intent is not to do that, what else can we do? And in 2021, in the specific moment that we live in, how can we kind of organize ourselves differently? So we've collaborated with people across geographies. Um, and there's also something really refreshing about working with people with like a different um, point of view and approach to things. You have to be careful sometimes. Um, you know, there's like an, a certain expectation of like New York City, like building and construction regulation in that environment. And then working with someone who's like based in the Balkans, who maybe like just has a, a very different approach because of the world that they, that they come from. Um, but it's been, it's been a really great opportunity to kind of be set up and be interested in that kind of exploration before the pandemic. And then all of a sudden like COVID-19 happens and as devastating as, as our new reality is, there's also certain aspects of it that I almost like feel guilty about thinking are really great. Um, and one of that thing, you know, one of those elements has been the adoption of technology such as Zoom or a go-to meeting, which is now not only like okay with clients, where maybe before like a face-to-face -face was absolutely critical, now it's also like expected and maybe even assumed. Hmm. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's allowed like a new type of firm organization um, to evolve. And it works well for like a small firm, I think. And I'm curious, like, could, like, when, when is the glass ceiling for this? Yeah, I mean, it definitely works. Uh, at Monograph, we're about nine, uh, 10 employees now, or 11. We, we've been hiring pretty quickly. By the end of the year, we'll probably be in the mid-20s, mm -hmm. and we're fully remote. Um, like, I'm in St. Petersburg, Florida, Director of Customer Success in Miami, and Zoom is really the method through which we've been able to work. Um, are so, time zones are time zones an issue with the rest of the team? Uh, no, because uh, functionally, actually, most of our let's say what we call go to market, like our sales, marketing, support side, um, sales will probably be more focused on the West Coast uh, with with new hires, while um, most of marketing and success is focused on is on the East Coast. So there there's enough of an overlap where it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I, um, and personally, I've had a lot of experiences where I worked across multiple different time zones. And I think now with the tools that allow for asynchronous communication, right, where it's not email, like we use Slack heavily, we hardly ever use email, mm -hmm. we can just communicate and then just, you know, you do have to be explicit about the expectations you're setting when you communicate with someone, like if I send you something off hours, it, or, or whatever, right, or just the, the time you might not allow, that it's not an immediate ask. You know, so there's there's nuances there, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's it's totally possible. Um, we do have a question. Actually, I do want to open up the, the rest of the time for questions. So if anybody has, I'm going to actually uh, do a little bit something different and, and allow uh, uh, guests to talk here. So, hi. You can see, uh, if you turn on your mic, you you'll be able to answer. I think. I don't know, maybe. Okay, it looks gonna, like they might they might have left or momentarily left after they raised their hand. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm don't be to, shy. Okay, I'm gonna lower the hand. But if there's anybody that has any questions that they can uh, feel free to use the Q and A section or raise your hand and we can allow you to to join. I, I don't know the name of but DT is the person. So maybe if they're not focused on the on the on the screen right now, we're just listening. Um, you're free to talk if you're around. But it looks like you're muted, so you have to unmute. Let's see. Okay. Um, all right. Well, while that well well they they uh, they decide to join or not. Um, I, I do have some other um, questions because you've interfaced a lot with developers and I'm very curious as to whether um, from, from your experience, is that something like, have you been building out that network with developers in general? Are you, uh, 
I think I read somewhere that you do, are you part of a bro or brokerage or you also do broker brokering on the side? Oh, um, so I got my real estate license, um, I think in 2016, maybe. Um, partially it was, it was uh, just, a, you know, we, we were working on a project um, and then decided to kind of, you know, we were interviewing um, people to help on the sales front and uh, we, we met really great people and, and it turned out that, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with like, there's no set fee for brokerage, but there's a kind of typically a benchmark that ends up shaking out and it's kind of a lot of money, but beyond the money, um, there was, you know, this kind of idea that if we're so involved in, you know, the thinking and, and the craft, and we've poured our, our heart, sweat, blood and tears into this project, um, maybe it would be really great for us to just talk about it. Um, and so that, that was kind of the main impetus. Um, but I have to say, I, I really enjoy it. I think for every architect, it would be great just knowledge. Um, it's so, you know, whether or not you are passionate about aspects of real estate, um, I think it's really empowering to know what kind of world we operate in and then be able to kind of take more agency and, and make projects out of things given that understanding and maybe um, just, just approach projects a different way, whether or not your agency or your motivation or ambition um, is about like placemaking for communities and public space. Like this is still relevant knowledge. It doesn't have to be about like selling a fancy apartment um, to someone, though it can be as well. Um, but anyway, so that that was kind of my initial interest. Um, and I've maintained that license and I, I, I work with people. I don't advertise it as much. It's usually people that um, I just know or when it comes up as a relevant part of a conversation with a client. Um, so I kind of, I would say, do it sparingly um, as part of sometimes a project. If it has like a different you know life cycle, we can capture more of that. And on some projects, it's really fun. Um, so... So that was kind of the initial impetus. And then since then I've helped, um, you know, clients purchase apartments and you realize how much knowledge you actually can contribute as an architect and someone who understands kind of the purchasing or the, or the buying process. Um, and so that also trickles into your other question about like an ecosystem. Um, and, and again, it's, it's, it's interesting to be able to, I think primarily just have that breadth of knowledge. And so you kind of ground decision-making as an architect versus uh, you know someone who's um, who's able to take on uh, that kind of you know approach so I mean I, I I I think it's personally personally I believe it's a very critical thing to to get involved into why because a lot of the things that you alluded to um, and you talked about explicitly but the the ability to be able to fully understand and comprehend the decision-making framework that somebody on the other your client has and be able to inf inform them and guide them through that decision-making process, um, it, it, it's just uh, very critical. I mean, otherwise, you know, there is always the danger that arch if architecture does not, as a profession, does not sort of take advantage of the opportunity to move upstream of the decision-making process. Mind you, like most people, right? They first, they don't even think about going to an architect until maybe a broker told them that they needed to, or someone else in the process. Cause the first thing that they're searching for is real estate related questions. They don't actually typically ask for architecture related questions, even when they're searching on Google. So how do you get in front of that conversation and decision-making process way sooner? It's through things like this that might seem, you know, you know, when we think about brokers, we look, we think about, oh, Bravo, and maybe like million dollar listing and that kind of life. But essentially, yes, there's that kind of world itself, but there's also just like being, an, uh, being able to inform, mm -hmm. technically inform people about the decisions that they're making and build that trust with them earlier on before they even need a, a, a space designed. Um, yeah, totally. I mean, I've, I've worked with a lot of brokers um, who I wasn't impressed by. And then other brokers who are just like super talented, super smart um, and have so much value add. But I think inherently um, it's, it's an option worth considering for architects because we, we have a certain set of eyes um, that you can embellish a kind of um, 
real estate service with. So, you know, it's not for everyone and it's not for me at any given moment. Um, but it, it's just another tool. It's kind of like, you know, we have Rhino, Rhino Grasshopper, Revit and real estate. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, okay. If there, anyone has any other questions, I think I might just close with my, um, my final one. Um, what is the kindest or nicest thing anyone's ever done for you? you Um, well, I would say personally, it would be like a series of things that my immediate family, um, starting probably from my grandmother to my parents. And then even my, my daughter the other day, when I, when I uh, came to pick her up from, from daycare, uh, her, her daycare provider said, you know, she was waiting for you on the bench and uh, she started tearing up the, the, you know, the daycare provider. And I said, what's going on? She's like, well, she told me she's waiting for, for her father and he's her best friend and that's the way it should be. And so that was like on a, on a very personal level. And then on a, on a, I think like more professional level, um, maybe going back to like that transition I was making at, um, from leaving the office I was working for, um, when I sat down for that kind of exit interview, um, they left me with like words of advice that in, in retrospect was so valuable. Um, and they not only allowed me to transition in a way that was um, flexible for what I wanted and, and what was good for the firm, but they also kind of just gave me a heads up about things to watch out for. And one of the things that they said is, you know, good people are hard to find. So when you find someone that's really good, even if you don't have a position for them, make it. Um, and it was little gems of wisdom like that that I think um, ultimately are, are the most valuable and, um, and hence just like really nice for them to, to have done, so. Wow. Hey, Don, thank you so much for that. Uh, I think we're all learning to ride our bikes. Uh, <laughs> uh, Put your helmet on. Yeah. Um, so I'd just like to kind of wrap it up and, and just uh, let everyone know what we're up to at, at Monograph. Uh, at Monograph, we're building the future of practice operations for architects and the design professionals. We make it easy for you and your team to track time and visualize how that time impacts project schedules, budgets, and team resources, all in real time. You'll never make decisions again in the dark with Monograph. Cool. Thanks so much, Adon. Thanks, George. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. Bye.